almost two years we are having the first uh, public program and uh, it's nice that we are having this public program restarted with uh, copy with curiosity and uh, it gives a surrealistic feeling to see so many people in one place in flesh and blood <laughs> we have all been used to seeing people behind the cameras on the screen and to see so many people uh, is a surreal uh, surrealistic feeling uh, so we welcome you all to this uh, new season of copy with curiosity in person that we will be hosting we are extremely glad that uh, the response is warm and we hope that in uh, coming months uh, uh, it will pick up so on behalf of uh, jawaharlal nehru planetarium and icts i welcome you all to this program and uh, now i request uh, uh, professor rukmini day to uh, introduce the speaker and also say a few words about icts Good evening, everyone. I'm Rukmini De, uh, faculty from Ma of mathematics in ICTS. A hearty welcome to all of you to the in-person Copy with Curiosity talk today, hosted by ICTS and JNP. Uh, I'll say a few words about ICTS. Uh, it is a research institute, part of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. We have a three-pronged mandate, research programs and outreach. We have in-house research in physics and maths, quantitative biology, and now also in computer science. We host many programs in all branches of science and math throughout the year, and most of the talks are available in our YouTube channel, ICTS Talks. As a part of outreach, we host several lectures, public lectures, math circles, and have school visits, and now started a science education program together with JNP. So I'm very happy to uh, uh, welcome today's speaker for our Copy with Curiosity, Professor Shupurna Sinha from Raman Research Institute. Professor Sinha did her master's and PhD in physics from Syracuse University, USA. Currently, she is a professor of theoretical physics at Raman Research Institute. Her areas of research are non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, quantum information, she has applied statistical mechanics to the context of soft, soft matter star, and studied DNA elasticity and active particles dynamics. Her work in the area of quantum Brownian motion has led to prediction of testable, uh, uh, pre pre predictions which are testable in ultra-cold atom labs. She has a passionate interest in science popularization and pursues art in her leisure time. So today she'll be talking of perspectives in art and math and art. So before that, I'd like to hand over a small memento to her from ICTS and JNP. So thank you very much. <laughs> over to you, Shapurna. Am I audible? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. So uh, I would like to thank uh, Rukmini and the rest of the ICTS outreach team for inviting me to talk at this forum. Uh, it's indeed a wonderful forum where a variety of interesting topics are discussed. And today is somewhat special because we are gathering here after two long years. And it's indeed very nice to see so many people gathering and let's start then. So the topic of my talk today is perspectives in math and art. So uh, let's start with these two paintings. So the painting on the left is an example of cave art from thousands of years back. And the painting on the right is an example from the Renaissance, European Renaissance time. So what is the central difference that you notice between these two paintings? So if someone from the audience can uh, respond to it or, yeah. Uh, yep. 
perspective. You are saying, yeah. Uh, the, there's a depth, yeah. There's a feeling of depth that you see, right? Yeah, this, that is the central difference. There are many differences in detail, but that's not what we are concerned with. But this central difference, yes. So both paintings are appealing in entirely different ways. We are not going to make a value judgment as to which one is better or which one is worse. Both are appealing in entirely different ways. But one obvious contrast is that the painting on the right gives a feeling of depth, as he noted, which is absent in the one on the left. So we will dwell into the mathematics behind the feeling of depth that paintings like the one on the right create. So Renaissance art provided a space for a rich interplay between art and math. And the mathematics that was born out of this interplay is called projective geometry. So notice that parallel lines on the floor, when extended, meet at a point, the vanishing point in the painting on the right. So let's go back to that painting on the, oh, sorry. Yeah, can we go back to the uh, full screen? I don't know whether, but uh, you can see that the, the painting on the right, if you look at the, these lines on the floor, yeah, they are, they are actually parallel lines. These are tiles, just like the parallel lines that you see on, on the floor over here. Can you see the uh, floor here? It's not very different from the floor over there. So these are parallel lines, right? So these are also parallel lines, but they seem to meet at a point, definite point on the canvas. So this is very different from what we have learned in Euclidean geometry in, the, in our school. Uh, we have learned that parallel lines don't meet. In contrast, in projective geometry, which is the mathematics that comes into play in the context of Renaissance art, parallel lines do meet at a finite point. So all of you would be very familiar with this particular view of railway tracks, and railway tracks are basically parallel lines, and they appear to meet at a point on the horizon very far away. This is precisely the effect that the Renaissance artists tried to capture on their canvas. And this is also the effect that the mathematicians who were thinking about this were trying to capture in their mathematics. So Renaissance artists would often locate the focus of the theme of the painting at the vanishing point. So this is a very famous painting from the Renaissance time. It's called the School of Athens. And as I had mentioned, that Renaissance artists tried to always locate the focus of the theme of the painting at the vanishing point. Here, if you notice, this is the vanishing point, And these two, two central figures are located there. So the, the figure on the left is that of Plato. And the one on the right is of Aristotle. And the figure of Plato is modeled after Leonardo da Vinci who was indeed an embodiment of the Renaissance movement, uh, a perfect amalgamation, amalgamation of the sciences and the arts. And one interesting detail I just wanted to mention, here in one corner you see the painter depicted. The painting was done by Raphael, and he has placed himself here in one corner. And this painting really represents the mood of the Renaissance. There's the, you can, if you look at it in detail, you'll see mathematics, philosophy, art, sciences, all, all of it represented here. This is exactly what the mood of the European Renaissance. So just to give a brief history of projective geometry, projective geometry dates back to actually 300 AD. There was a Greek mathematician named Pappus. Pappus's theorem was the earliest theorem in projective geometry. And so in a sense, Pappus had preempted the mathematical revolution that took place during the Renaissance time. In 1600 AD, AD Pascal's theorem 
was formulated, which is essentially a generalization of Tappus's theorem from straight lines to conics. What are conics? You would uh, recall that is basically you take a cone and you consider a slicing plane, and depending on the way you slice the cone, you get various different conic sections or conics, circles, ellipses, parabolas, hyperbolas, and so on and so forth. And in the 1600s, Desargues theorem also was formulated. Desargues was an engineer mathematician interested in art, a perfect representation of the Renaissance time. So around the time of Desargues work in the domain of projective geometry, Descartes and others introduced Cartesian geometry. And unfortunately, the world saw a dominance of Cartesian geometry and calculus and a decline in the interest of projective geometry. There was, however, a reemergence of projective geometry in the 1800s, thanks to the works of Mobius, Klein, Chasselet, and others. So basic, what are the basic notions that come into play in projective geometry? One is the intersection of, they are called meets and joins. So the intersection of two lines is called a meet. So you have two lines, the intersection point is called a meet. So if you represent the lines as capital L and capital M, the meet is represented as capital LM. And the other concept is, the, if you consider two points, the line joining the two points is called a join. And if you consider little a and little b to be the two points, then the join is little ab. So let's go over the statement of Pappus's theorem. What does Pappus's theorem tell us? So consider, let's focus on this particular image. Consider the three blue points, A, B, and C, lying on the blue line. And the, there's another blue line on which there are three other points, A prime, B prime, and C prime. Now consider joining these points crosswise. So the intersection of A, B prime, and B, A prime is a red point over there. And the intersection of B, C prime, and C, B prime is another red point. And the intersection of A, C prime, and C, A prime is a third uh, red point. So there are these three red points. The, uh, the claim is that all these three red points lie on a single line. And that is called the Pappus's line. So one uh, thing I would like you to notice in the statement of the uh, theorem, there is no mention of uh, a line segment, the measure of a line segment, or the measure of an angle, which is very different from the kind of theorems we encountered in Euclidean geometry. So in projective geometry, all lines are extended. So Pascal's theorem <coughs> is an extension of Pappus's theorem to the context of conics. So conics, uh, for instance, in this particular diagram, we have considered an ellipse. And there are these six points, A, E, C, F, B, D. Now, again, consider joining these points crosswise the way it was done in the context of Pappus's theorem. So you notice that the two red lines meet at a white point. The two bl blue lines meet at another white point, And the two yellow lines meet at a third white point. So the claim is that these three white points lie on a single line. That's the statement of Pascal's theorem. So notice that uh, uh, in both Pappus's, Pappus's theorem involves only straight lines. Pascal's theorem, on the other hand, involves conics. So now one important feature of projective geometry is that in spite of the fact that there are curves involved, it is really a geometry of the straight edge. Straight edge is a most common instrument that you use. Uh, it's a ruler that you, you that is not only there in your geometry box. You use it to measure the height of a chair, for instance. So it's a most common device. And just by with the use of a ruler and a pencil, you can draw not only straight lines. You can actually draw curves, conics like the el ellipses and hyperbole and all that. So I, this is just a. Uh, concrete representation of how conics are represented, parabola, uh, circle, ellipse, hyperbola, all these 
are got as conic sections. So uh, I would like to now start a video to show how an ellipse is generated from a family of straight lines. So. Okay, so today I'm going to show you this lovely method of drawing conics in projective geometry. All you need is a pencil, paper, and a straight edge to be able to do this. Um, it's remarkably simple um, as far as the steps you actually have to take. Now, I'm using a software program called GeoGebra because, as you can see, it does involve drawing rather a lot of lines to make a good picture. But the actual method is just very, very simple. And it also involves the idea of projection, which is really the sort of core concept behind, as you probably guessed, projective geometry. So hopefully you'll enjoy learning the method and seeing all these beautiful shapes you can make. I've always found it kind of fascinating how one can generate these lovely curved objects by only using straight lines. So let me just show you the simple method. Start with a line with, say, three dots on it. And then we're going to add an extra yellow point. This is what's called a center of perspectivity. And we're going to do a perspective from this blue line onto this green line. So what that basically means is that we're going to draw a line of our blue line that we're interested in and see where they end up. So it's as if one had put an eye at the yellow points and then observe where the corresponding points would appear on the green line. And so essentially by this perspective we get these new three points on the green line. So that's what's called a perspective or maybe a perspectivity with respect to the center of perspective, which is a yellow point. Um, and now we're going to do another perspectivity. So we're going to do one with respect to this orange center of perspectivity here onto this red line. So, if you try and ignore the blue line, the blue and yellow lines, you should be able to see again what's going on is basically analogous. We're just putting this orange point down, drawing lines through the green points, and seeing where they end up getting sort of moved to onto this red line. And so, it's just another perspectivity. And so basically what we've done is we started off with three blue points and then we did one perspective on them to change them onto the green line. Then we did another perspective on them to change them onto a red line. So we've done a sequence of perspectivities. That's called a projection. So we've done a projection from the blue line onto the red line. Anyway, what's the method? Well, basically, we just see this big red um, dot here hopefully you can if you pause the video or something you can convince yourself this is the projection of this original big blue point now all we do is link the original object to the red point it's been projected to and then I'm doing this in GeoGebra which has this wonderful feature called trace which basically means that um, if an object moves around, you can see as if one was viewing it with a um, with a long exposure camera. And so now, if I just drag around this blue point here, one can see that it's actually sweeping out a curve. In fact, it's sweeping out an ellipse, which is very interesting. So, all the different conic sections can be generated in this way. Um, it just depends on how on the original setup of the objects.
So, so I just wanted to show you concretely how an ellipse is, for instance, generated with a family of straight lines. So, projective geometry, as we know, is math born out of art. The Renaissance artists realized that parallel lines meet at the horizon. Straight lines must be represented by straight lines. And the image of a conic is also a conic. This is a very interesting feature of projective geometry. For instance, the image of a circle is an ellipse. So, I'll concretize it a little bit more with a specific example. So, consider a parabola on the Cartesian plane. So, for instance, this one. So, what will happen to this parabola when we go to a uh, canvas of a Renaissance artist or the projective plane? So, the thing is that it will end up looking like an ellipse. So, let's try to understand it a little bit more. So, you know that a Cartesian plane, on the Cartesian plane, there is a mutually perpendicular grid of lines, lines parallel to the x-axis and par lines parallel to the y-axis. So, the lines parallel to the y-axis, for instance, converge at a po point on the horizon because of this railway track effect. Consequently, suppose you take the points on the parabola 1, 1 and 2, 4 and so on and so forth. They end up here and here and so on and so forth. And finally, the curve that you will generate on the canvas or the projective plane is an ellipse. So, this is a very interesting feature of projective geometry as we, as I have emphasized over and over again that conics are generated by a uh, plane, slicing plane and a cone and depending on how you slice it, you generate different conics. So, the projective geometry, as if the projective geometry is reminding us of this common origin of all the conics. It is setting an equivalence between all the conics. And this is something that the Greeks have had perhaps realized already, but it is being emphasized in projective geometry. Both Desart and the artists realized that points at infinity need to be added to represent the horizon. This is needed both for art and mathematic, mathematical theorems like Desart's theorem and Pappus's theorem. One hallmark of projective geometry is the absence of reference to any measurement, which I had emphasized while stating Pappus's theorem or Pascal's theorem, unlike Euclidean geometry. For instance, all lines are extended in projective geometry. So, the projective plane is basically the ordinary plane plus the line at infinity added. In a projective plane, any two lines meet at a point. This is actually a fairly non-trivial statement because in Euclidean geometry, we, we only say that non-parallel lines meet. Parallel lines and non-parallel lines belong to different classes. And projective geometry is actually bringing about an equivalence between non-parallel lines and parallel lines. In a projective plane, any two points join to make a line. So, the state, notice the similarity between the statements I made about the lines and the points. So, thus there is a duality between points and lines in projective geometry, as if you can interchange the roles of points and lines and even after doing that you will see that the theorems hold true. So, Poncelet was a very significant figure in the realm of projective geometry. Uh, Poncelet was born at the time of uh, the French Revolution and he literally brought about a revolution in the domain of mathematics. So, projective geometry, there are two key principles thanks to Poncelet. One is the principle of continuity, which I alluded to in the last slide. And this is taken from an article by Ramanan in Resonance. So, here you see a family of lines meeting at a point, right? And down here there is a fixed line. Now, you can consider tilting these lines to make them parallel to this fixed line. So, you automatically see that there is a continuity between non-parallel lines and parallel lines. This is a feature which is special to projective geometry. And the second principle is the principle of duality, which I had also mentioned earlier, interchanging the roles of points and lines. 
as it uh, you can freely interchange the roles of points and lines. If a theorem holds in the projective plane, then its dual holds in the dual projective plane. Thus, there are duals of all theorems, Pappus's theorem, Pascal's theorem, and so on, that I've mentioned earlier. Now, we'll come to the uh, notion of a complex projective geometry. So, here you notice that, oops, sorry. Here there is a conic Q, which I denoted by Q, and uh, a line AB, okay? So, the intersection of a conic and a line, what, what does it do? So, many of you would be familiar with the, uh, yeah, with the equation of a parabola, for example, y equals x squared, let's we keep it simple, and a line, say y equals x. And if you want to find out the intersection between the conic and the line, all you have to do is to solve them simultaneously, these equations and you end up with a quadratic equation. And a quadratic equation, as you know, has two roots. So those two roots correspond to the intersection points. Okay. So you notice that AB intersects the conic at two distinct points. EF, on the other hand, is tangential to the conic. So one can say that it intersects the conic at two coincident points, like the notion of coincident roots. But one thing some somewhat unsettling happens when you look at CD. CD doesn't seem to intersect the conic at all. So what is happening? It looks like there is an apparent breakdown in the notion of continuity. One would have been happier if in all cases the conic and the line had two intersections. So how, what does one do? Yeah, so, so uh, it's an interesting thing that is happening. That's where the complex part is coming up. Yeah, exactly. It's connected to that. So um, if you introduce complex coordinates, that enables the restoration of continuity. So what, what is happening is that although it looks like they are, this line CD is not intersecting the conic at all, if you go to the complex plane, you'll find that it intersects the conic at two points on the complex plane. So applications of complex projective spaces in physics. So, so there are, this is just, this, this may be somewhat advanced, but I just thought I'll show this slide just to uh, make you aware of the scope of projective geometry, complex projective geometry. So complex projective spaces actually appear uh, these are spaces like CP1, which is the complex projective line, come into play in the realms of quantum information. The space of qubits is described by CP1, and geometric phases, which have several applications in physics, and one of the more current applications is geometric quantum computation. And this is very relevant to the realm of uh, quantum computation because of the robustness of geometric phases. It finds applications in fault-tolerant quantum computation. So here I have drawn two images. There are, uh, these are two images. This, this one, which looks like a circle, corresponds to what is called RP1, real projective line. So what is it? It's just the ordinary line with a point at infinity added on. That's how you're getting a circle from a line. And there is another space over here, which is CP1, this complex projective line. So what is it? It's the complex plane with a point at infinity added on. And that's why it is actually, it looks like a sphere. It's called the Riemann sphere. So one thing that I wanted to reflect on at this point is that in all these spaces, you have this point at infinity added on. This is common between what we have seen in Renaissance art and the mathematics over here. In the Renaissance painting, if you remember, the, apart from the ordinary plane that we are used to here, for instance, there are these parallel lines. They seem to be not meeting if you look close by, at least definitely. But the Renaissance artist added a point at infinity and made it a definite point on the canvas. So this addition of a point at infinity is common between what is happening in art and in mathematics. So 
I wanted, okay, before uh, moving to the next slide, I wanted to give a more familiar example of the use of comp uh, complex pro projected space. Okay, here it's complex projected space. The example that I'm giving is an example of a real projective space, but nevertheless it's projective space, all right. So uh, all of you ha carry mobile phones, and mobile phones have liquid crystals in them. And there is this pneumatic liquid crystal, which consists of hard rods, which are, which are like this, and they are aligned overall in a common direction. So in order to uh, describe such a system and analyze it, one needs to make use of projective spaces. In particular, the space is called RP2, real projective plane. So projective geometry, after all, we are talking about the intersection of math and art. So projective geometry through drawing. So this is a uh, nice illustration of Dürer's perspective machine. Dürer was a well-known Renaissance artist. And what are the key elements in this kind of drawing? One is the object, the picture plane, and the eye. So you have the eye. So that is exactly what is represented here. The eye is here, the picture plane is here, and the object is somewhere here. So you or I can consider drawing an apple on a table, for instance. So what do we do? The, the canvas is placed between the eye and the object, the apple on the ta table. And you have these sight lines, that are lines connecting your eye to the object. And these lines will pierce the canvas, right? So you take all those points and join them together. And that's how you recon reconstruct the picture of the apple on the table. So more concretely, this is the kind of thing that is happening. Here is the eye, the picture plane, and it's a drawing of a, uh, the artist is trying to draw a flower in a box. And this is what is happening. These are the sight lines, which are piercing the canvas at various points, and you join them together to reconstruct them. Now, the Renaissance artists came up with very in interesting devices to make their drawings as accurate as possible. They wanted to represent the three-dimensional objects on a two-dimensional plane. And Brunelleschi, the Italian architect, used a mirror with a hole to make his architectural drawings as accurate as possible. So you can actually, it will take some time to describe exactly how he did it, but I can do that later if needed. But uh, there is a nice YouTube channel where you can find out about this. Now, uh, the great Leonardo da Vinci used a device called the perspectograph. And here is a notion of a two-point perspective that emerged around 1505. So till now, I, was, I have been emphasizing this one-point perspective, all these parallel lines meeting at a point. But often, if you have two vanishing points rather than one, you can get a more accurate picture of an architectural structure, for instance. And it looks like the earliest uh, example of that happened around 1505. Now, yeah, this is just to illustrate that there are actually families of parallel lines, not just one set of parallel lines that you can think of. So this is a set of tiles, very similar to the tiles over here. So you have a set of parallel lines meeting at this point. Uh, then you have a set of diagonals which meet at another uh, second point and another set of parallel lines meeting at a third point. And you can join them to make a line in the horizon. So this is a, actually the most interesting and most familiar device. It's called the camera obscura. This, many of you in your school days, you must have come across a pinhole camera, right? So may, maybe some of you have even made it out of a shoebox. So here you see a picture of a Renaissance artist. What the artist is doing is actually sitting inside a pinhole camera or a camera obscura. So here there is a, hole in the wall and the, there is a landscape out there and the artist is trying to draw the landscape 
by making use of the pinhole camera image that is there on this wall. As you know, the pinhole camera makes an inverted image. So the artist traces out the, uh, whatever the image is. And all he needs to do is that the canvas is placed here. Uh, at the end of the drawing, he needs to take the canvas and put it upside down. Then he has a right side up representation of the landscape, which is outside. So I want to emphasize this point that elements of perspective were indeed present in medieval art. That is much before the Renaissance. So this is an example of a artwork from 1389 in Paris. And here you see that objects which are far away look smaller than the objects which are closer to the viewer's eye. This is exactly what perspective is meant to do. What is even more interesting is that way back in between 59 CE and 79 CE in Pompeii, there are instances of perspective art on the fresco, in the frescoes of Pompeii. On the walls, they painted and it showed that the artist knew how to draw uh, something with accurate three-dimensional perspective. And this is something that I myself have uh, experienced because I've been to Pompeii and I was really rather struck that such so early on the artist had this idea of how to draw a uh, three-dimensional structure accurately on um, the wall. So just to summarize, although there were examples of perspective in, perspective in art prior to the European Renaissance, the merging of mathematics and art happened only during the Renaissance. An intuitive understanding of perspective was perhaps there among earlier artists. However, a comprehensive un understanding emerging from the interplay of art and math did not happen before the Renaissance. So now I come to a central theorem that was formulated during the Renaissance time. It's called the Zach's theorem. And the statement is, if two triangles are in perspective via a point, they are in perspective via a line. So for instance, here you see two triangles, ABC and A prime B prime C prime. So they are said, said to be in perspective with respect to the, this point O. And given that, one has to prove that they are in perspective with respect to this line L. Now, uh, the statement uh, may appear somewhat uh, confusing to some people. So I, I thought that I'll uh, emphasize a few points. OK, f first of all, you can understand why these triangles have been arranged in this particular way. It's not, not different from the way a Renaissance artist wanted to draw a picture. So here is the artist's eye. This is the picture plane, and this is the actual object. It's basically like that. So what does one mean by being in perspective via line? It's somewhat obscure. So one way to think about it is to go to the dual projective plane. In the dual projective plane, the line will be a point. And then you end up with the same notion as this one. So that's one way to understand this statement. So let's go over the proof of this. This proof is actually quite simple. That's why I thought that I'll go over it. So first of all, we have these points, A, B, C, and A prime, B prime, C prime. So first join the cor corresponding points, A, A prime, B, B prime, and C, C prime. All these lines join to, together at point O. Now the claim is that if you take the corresponding edges, A, B, and A prime, B prime, and B, C, and B prime, C prime, and A, C, and A prime, C prime, then these three intersection points, the claim is that these three intersection points lie on a single line. So how does one, how does one go about proving it? So the intersection points of AB, A prime, B prime, intersection point of BC and B prime, C prime, and the intersection point of AC and A prime, C prime lie on a single line. That's the thing that we have to show. Let I be the intersection line of intersection of the two slicing planes. So think about it this way. The triangle ABC lies on a plane P, say. And the triangle A prime, B prime, C prime lies on another plane P prime. So you know that given two planes, the two planes intersect along a line, right? So that's the line 
L. So now, since now the proof is ob almost obvious, let L be the intersection, uh, line of intersection of the two slicing planes. Then B C and B prime C prime lie on these two planes, right? B C lies on P and B prime C prime lies on P prime. So the intersection lies on the intersection, the line L of these two slicing planes. And this holds true for A B and A prime B prime and A C and A prime C prime. So that proves the theorem. So just to conclude, European Renaissance saw the merging of art and mathematics. Projective geometry was born out of that intersection. Projective geometry offers a path for artists to appreciate mathematics and for mathematicians to appreciate art. Projective geometry is indeed the most fundamental and the underpinning of all other forms of geometry. It has several applications in physics. I mentioned a couple, uh, quantum information and quantum computation, and even the liquid crystals that are there in your mobile phones or your know, laptops. So I just wanted to end the talk with a quote by Leonardo da Vinci, which is very dear to me. Uh, art is the queen of all sciences. And thank you for your attention. And here are some references. It's a uh, nice article by Ramanan in Resonance. And there's an excellent set of lectures by Weisberger on YouTube uh, on projective geometry, uh, from the most elementary to the most advanced. A brief history of perspective in European art, which is also on, available on YouTube. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Sapunna. Thank you so much for this beautiful and interesting talk. Thanks. Uh, now the floor is open for questions, so you can raise your hands. Mic will go to you. You, you have to uh, speak into the mic. Okay. Hi, ma'am. Hello. How did the Renaissance artists make use of uh, the theorems of projective geometry in their paintings yeah. while drawing? Okay. Uh, yeah, this is a s somewhat, uh, 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 it's an interesting question. So, I think many of the artists were probably not even thinking about the mathematical aspect, and they were perhaps doing things intuitively. But there, are, there were examples like Desarc, for example, who was both a mathematician and an artist. So people like Desarc probably started noticing that while drawing, that there is an interesting underlying mathematics behind it. And there was a, like a strong interaction between the artists and the mathematicians. The, the boundary was not respected at that time. That was a very healthy kind of interaction between mathemat mathematicians and artists. So I think from the mathematicians, the artists learn and vice versa. Can I ask one more question or yeah. later? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, uh, what about the uh, occurrence of depth uh -huh. of paintings in other civilizations? What do we know about that? Uh -huh. When did it start? Yeah, so uh, I give one example from uh, Pompeii, which is in a uh, very ancient site in Italy, and that was like 59 to uh, 79 CE, there were examples. So, uh, uh, typically, if you look at uh, I, I Indian art, like say, say Rajput painting or Mughal paintings, you, you see that uh, lack of perspective. It, it's very interesting painting, no doubt, but there is a sort of a juxtaposition of perspectives. That is to be, dis I, I must tell you that in, the, in Europe also there were examples of people like Matisse and uh, beyond Cubists or others who had played around with uh, perspectives in a different way. Like they have deliberately broken the rules of perspective and after knowing uh, what the perspective rules are. So I, I feel that many of these uh, other instances like this Rajput painting and so on and so forth, at that time I think the, uh, the realization of, about perspective wasn't there. But I'm not aware of everything that has happened around the world. Maybe there were examples which, are, which we are not aware of in other parts of the world. I had, I gave you one very early example from Italy, but there may have been uh, in other parts of the world. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, ma'am, is it certain that parallel lines are meeting at a point, in, at a finite point? Because what we have learned all our life is that parallel lines never meet. Mm -hmm. But in, according to projective geometry, parallel lines are meeting at a finite point. So yeah. is it certain? It's, it's uh, okay, uh, I gave you the example of the railway tracks. I, actually, that's an example from real life. And if you look at, you see, close by, the uh, railway tracks definitely look parallel and they definitely look like they, they are not meeting. But when you look at the horizon, they do appear to meet. So actually, so, so I would say that it, it's actually a real effect that they are trying to capture. And uh, in, in a sense, even in Euclid's statement, sometimes you find this kind of a statement. They don't uh, always say the parallel lines don't meet. They sometimes say, parallel lines meet at infinity. So as if projective geometry is bringing in that point in infinity uh, and making it a definite point. Okay, and one more question. Uh, we were discussing about that line which is intersecting a circle at two points, giving mm -hmm. rise to parabolic equation. Yeah. Then, it is given, uh, then it is tangential to the circle, which huh. means that uh, accordingly to real mathematics, discriminant would be zero. So it is only one repeated Coincident, solution. Yeah, yeah. And there was one line which is not touching at all, which right, right. means that uh, the solution lies in complex plane. That's correct, exactly. So uh, does complex plane, does it really, uh, like is it also certain, does it lie in the real world? The complex plane definitely, I mean, uh, okay, I don't know what you mean by does it uh, belong in the real world. There, there are so many, uh, uses of complex plane that have been uh, that are all around uh, to describe physics i mean and those are real physics like you can may do experiments in the lab with liquid systems and to describe them in an effective and precise way you need to make use of these complex projective spaces so it is so it is certain yeah it is certain uh, According to Pythagoras' theorem, like two triangles are in uh, perspective through a point, if they are like uh, perspective through a line, is it the opposite also same? Yes, like, the opposite is also true. Can we, we prove it uh, using like how just we? I I, I suppose so. I I have, I have not uh, shown it here, but uh, you can prove it. It's it's, it's uh, that's that's the interesting aspect of projective geometry. All the theorems that you see, the dual duals are equally true. You can interchange the roles of points and lines. Thank you, ma'am. Um, hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, ma'am, uh, can you please uh, explain uh, like how uh, this uh, projective uh, geometry is used in case of uh, liquid pneumatics? In, in so, uh, uh, pneumatic liquid crystals. Pneumatic liquid crystals. Yeah. No, pneumatic crystal, liquid crystals are basically they they consist of headless arrows, right? So so the head and the tail are interchangeable. Yes. So if they had not been interchangeable, you would think of them, think of the description in terms of a sphere. But here, because of the identifications, the relevant manifold is what is called RP2, the real projective. So because plane. we take it as stacking, right? So like. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Th this, yeah. So ba basically, for this you need a little bit of mathematics, but that's the basic idea. Uh, this question is also about Desargues theorem. So how do we know that the intersection of the line, the point that, uh, point at which the lines AC and A prime C prime, BC and B prime C prime, uh, AB and A prime B prime intersect, how do we know that those points are collinear? Yeah, that, that is the whole point. Oh, uh, maybe I should, I'll go over it one more time, yeah. So the point is that in general they, they you wouldn't expect them to be collinear. Any three two points you can say that they are collinear, but three points need not be. But the reason why it happens is basically because ABC, consider the triangle ABC, that lies on this plane P. The triangle A prime, B prime, C prime, on the other hand, lie on this other other plane P prime. Right? 
So you know for sure that two planes intersect at a line. That you agree with, right? So this same line happens to be the line on which these three points lie. And how do you, how do you prove it? It's basically by noticing that, say, the line AB line lies on the plane P. And the line A prime B prime lies on the plane P prime. So the intersection of these two lines will lie, at the, lie on the intersection of these two planes. And that will be true for the other pairs also. That's the way, that's the proof. Actually, the proof is in a way so simple that it sounds like a statement. Uh, so uh, that's one interesting nature of this, uh, this arc theorem. Hello, madam. Uh, so actually, uh, in one of those uh, statement, uh, one of those theorems in which there were two lines, and uh, you selected some points, and when we joined them, it appeared it it, it was in a straight line. Mm -hmm. So there, uh, there's a statement that uh, we take one point and join the other points, not the x point. I mean, uh, which is on the other side of the line. So is there a uh, sense of numbering of the points? Uh, uh, actually, that's a good point. Okay, I'll sh let's go back. Yeah, this, this is a, this one or this one, yeah, both yeah. these Th have this Yeah, thing, this yeah? one, and uh, next yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this one, this one is actually the same thing for a conic. Uh, here, here we have arranged all the points on a conic. Here we have arranged the points on two lines. That's yeah. the only difference. Yeah, so like here we didn't join A, A prime A. Yeah. Uh, so that's what, like, if do we have a sense of numbering yeah, of the actually points? Actually, in, in a sense, there is no sense of num numbering. I, I have... I have uh, drawn it in this particular way. You can actually, you c there is a lot more freedom compared to what. So if we join A prime A and B prime B, C prime C. Oh, oh, you are saying no. Uh, okay, okay. A, 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 sorry. Yeah, once once you stick to a labeling, you j you have you just stick to that. So so, that's the that's true. That, that much, yeah. That, uh, that so why I asked was like, uh, when we started from the intersection point, mm -hmm. so suppose we do not, we just take randomly some points. We do not have any sense of like uh, how much far we have to take. And we take on both these lines. So then there might, a situation might come where A prime and A are not, if we number them, they are not five and five in both the sides. It might be five on one side and fourth point on the other side. So in that case. No, uh, here we are restricting to the, num the number of points we are restricting to three and okay. three. Yeah, that, that, is, that is there. Uh, and in the next uh, uh, yeah. figure, so again, is there a, a sense of like uh, division of these two arcs? I mean, this AEC on one arc and DBF on uh, the points? Yeah, I, I think there is some freedom in the choice, but in fact, there are, there are situations where you can arrange the points in such a way, and suppose, suppose you join the lines, they turn out to be parallel. But we know that parallel lines also meet at a point. So you can say that that point and the other intersection points are collinear. That those situations also arise. Uh, one more question. Like, uh, so uh, in two parallel lines, uh, they meet at some finite point in this vertical geometry. So like if we take two parallel lines and two lines which are not parallel in the Euclidean sense, mm -hmm. so uh, is there any difference in those two in the projected, projective geometry? In the projective geometry, there's no difference, as I said. So parallel lines will meet, and non-parallel li lines will also meet. So that, that's one of the things that I had mentioned earlier, that the equivalence of all lines. That uh, is the principle of continuity. Uh, Ma'am, uh, one more question. Like, uh, uh, so if we see the drawings of buildings and all, uh, like uh, the architecture drawings and all, yeah. generally they have a sense of this depth. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this like ancient uh, buildings and all, with, so their drawings and all, there were no instances where such kind of depths were seen. Yeah, in fact, that's, uh, that's one of the examples that I was giving actually. This is from Pompeii, very early on, 59 to 79 AD, around that time. Here, actually, there are examples of frescoes where they showed that, it showed that they had a sense of perspective. So that is quite interesting. Without, as far as we know, they didn't have this kind of highly sophisticated mathematical ideas developed at that time. 
but they had an intuitive understanding as to how to draw it to make it look three dimensional. Uh, just last question. Uh, yeah, so actually, uh, that uh, I, uh, that uh, railway lines meeting when we see far uh, meeting at the horizon, it appears that it meets at a point. Uh, but uh, this concept of death and all, uh, so that is because of the uh, geometry of the earth, right? Like to uh, railway tracks meeting no, at the horizon. No, no, no. The, on this, on such scales, you don't see the spherical geometry of the earth. It's, uh, it, it is not connected it's to that. To Thank you. Yeah. Lines. Yeah. yeah. So basically, I'll just go back to that statement again. Yeah. So basically, the idea is that uh, there seems to be a symmetry between the way lines and points appear in projective geometry. So, in a projective plane, any two lines meet at a point. So this is the thing that we were discussing that parallel as well as non-parallel lines, everything, all lines meet at a point. And the statement with about the uh, point is that in a projective plane, any two points may join to make, uh, make a line. So as if you can, in fact, even without going to the mathematics, uh, the statements also you see that there is an uh, interchangeability between lines and points. And that's what I think they made use of in projective geometry. And that's why you have this in very beautiful thing of the theorems and their dual, dual theorems both being equally true. Hello, ma'am. Uh, yeah. I think this was also my doubt. So uh -huh. thank you for asking the question. My doubt was, uh, does Euclidean geometry and projective geometry intersect at any point? Yeah, right. actually, I think there are some uh, theorems which are common between projective geometry and Euclidean geometry. That, that there are theorems. That so are where do they mainly differ, excluding yeah, the part of Yeah, I think the main difference is basically that exclusion in the Euclidean geometry, you don't, uh, you're not including that point at infinity, whereas here you are including the point at infinity. And that's the crux of the matter. And that's precisely the reason why we can make the statement that in a projective plane, any two lines meet. That statement is not true in Euclidean geometry. In Euclidean geometry, you can say that non-parallel lines meet, parallel lines do not meet. That aut automatically breaks down the structure. So other than that point, in. it's common. Yeah, there are many things which are common, but there are, and no, no, there are uh, other points of difference because we are not referring to any uh, length of line segment. All lines are extended, so that is a very important thing or angular measures. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, Pythagorean geometry has been used in physics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is the earliest work in physics that made use of projective geometry? Earliest? Uh, uh, okay, this qubit idea is quite early, right? Quantum mechanics, with the birth of quantum mechanics, qubits were already there. It's true that now there is, it's, it has got more prominence because of quantum information and all that. So that is one example. And even pneumatic liquid crystals have been there for a very long time. But maybe the more mathematical understanding of these uh, liquid crystals have happened at a later point of time. Right. One more question is, what was the motivation behind these geometers who developed this projective geometry? Was it just, uh, of course, all, all of these are very interesting properties, Pappus theorem, that there are points being concurrent and all. So was it just uh, uh, exploring these interesting observations, or was there any other modeling or motivation behind this the development of this entire geometry? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, at least in the Renaissance time, the motivation definitely came from art. It was really to the Renaissance artists wanted to represent all three-dimensional objects faithfully on the canvas. So how can you do that? So that was the challenge. And since the Renaissance, uh, the atmosphere was such that there was no distinction between artists and mathematicians. Many artists were mathematicians. Many mathematicians were artists. Leonardo da Vinci was both, and so on and so forth. So uh, projective geometry, at least the recent history, is definitely can be traced to art. The very early example that I gave, 300 AD Pappus, 
that was i think there the motivation was purely mathematical maybe he was he was just exploring something so um, professor purna we have one question from the uh, one of our live stream viewers uh -huh. so do uh, do we have a similar projective geometry in indian art and architecture yeah i think there was a uh, question like that uh, earlier but uh, not not that i know of but may, maybe okay he seems to okay uh, oh okay no no yeah uh, the only example that i am aware of is this one from pompey but uh, traditionally all the indian art that i am familiar with uh, like rajput painting or the paintings from ajanta elora all those are beautiful works of art but i have not seen instances of use of this kind of three dimensional gear depth okay, thank you you have a question yeah um the love that shah jahan had for his wife uh -huh. um what i've heard is that um when you look from far all the alphabets look at the same uh, size uh, -huh. uh but obviously when you go closer uh, each alphabet is of a different size okay. so that i think maybe it's okay, what you're I referring to because when you see it from far mm -hmm. they wanted you to see it everything as the same size and shape mm -hmm. uh but obviously they are all under different uh, the sizes keep changing okay um so the thing of the railway line thing so it it, it doesn't seem that it's going to be all meet or they had it all been of the same size then i think the alphabets would have been much mm -hmm. uh, so that's one example that i can think of in indian art but i don't know if it really relates because i'm not from uh -huh. this field uh, okay for you to uh, see if that makes sense okay thanks for the example this uh, fourier transform and this uh, reciprocal space that we talk when we consider the uh, x ray uh, like uh, sorry yeah. i mean crystal structure so are this also like will you uh, link these also to the uh, this uh, theorem that you uh, uh, fourier space has to do with the basically there is a reciprocal relation between the space and the fourier space right for instance k the wave vector is 2 pi over a so that's so that's a sort of a different kind of a relation uh -huh. yeah here it is a lattice and reciprocal lattice uh, hello uh, the, in do projective geometry deal with measurement of length of a line segment or distance or something because uh, when yeah. you move on from euclidean geometry to differential geometry there is metric curvature and all sorts of things are those things are still there in projective geometry in the proje uh, projective geometry i mean that, that's one of the features that they seem to move away from those metrical notions but i sup i i suppose one can put a metric on such projective spaces i think there are, for instance fubini's 2d metric and things like that you can put on on this yeah that's right right exactly so you can add yeah yeah in fact that's what comes up in the, the study of geometric phases like in the geometric phase you have three points on the sphere and you look at the geodesic triangle and these theorems can they be proved using the metric and explicitly calculating some distances yeah, or something so i i think you can add add on the metrical structures and and prove these things but then it will be like uh, you are adding more structure than what is necessary so that's one one thing
Yeah, I mean, uh, we have one more question online by Kiran. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding projective geometry in space-time navigation? So I guess. Oh, space, space-time navigation. Uh, that would be very hard to for me to comment on. Or maybe <laughs> he wants to know uh, how projective geometry is used in navigation. Uh -huh. Is there any? Okay. I mean. I suppose, for instance, in this railway track effect, if you if you know that it is converging, I mean, as as you go closer to that point, you'll see that things will look more parallel, the usual notion of parallel, and far away it will look like they are converging. But I don't know whether it's connected to navigation. I don't think I can answer this question. Oh. Uh, there is another, uh, I think, uh, comment. But even I had a similar question. So uh, there is an online uh, viewer, Naman. Mm -hmm. Not having studied quantum mechanics, I can't really imagine how projective spaces would be used to formalize what I know intuitively about the way QM works. Maybe how this entire framework is used in quantum mechanics. That's what he's. Uh, uh, there is an example in quantum mechanics which I had given of the qubit space, the space of qubits. So that is one example in quantum mechanics where concretely uh, projective space is used. Okay. Um, okay, so if uh, there are no more questions, then I'll just announce the next talk. So um, the next talk is by Professor Matthew uh, on uh, coping with salt and drought, how crop plants survive on May 8th next uh, Next talk is on May 8th, Sunday at 4 p.m. So, uh. okay. So we close today. Thanks again, Supurna, yeah. for this beautiful session. Thanks for Thank you. many thanks, many thanks for the attention and the, also the very nice questions. Thanks.